many of us know that there is a special session that will be starting on July 18th. Our next weekly witness will be the day before, so Monday, July 17th, and during that episode, we'll be talking specifically about uh, issues that are going to be coming up in the special session. We're going to try to stay focused today on our legislative wrap-up, but before we get there, there are a couple of announcements related to the special session. Uh, first, uh, Texas Impact during the regular session uh, did not talk a lot about what folks referred to as the bathroom bill. We talked about it being a, a distraction from more important issues that were coming up like foster care or public education, and so we didn't work on it during the regular session. That being said, if you watched our, our episode, our last episode of Weekly Witness, uh, B. Moorhead, our executive director, talked about this being one of the 20 issues that were on the, uh, the call uh, for the special session. And because our membership keeps asking us about this issue, and because some state leaders talk about the influence of people of faith being one of the reasons that, that we need the quote-unquote bathroom bill, uh, Texas Impact during the special session will be taking a position and working on this issue. And that's because, as people of faith, uh, discrimination is not something that is within our value system. Uh, discrimination is not okay, and as Texans, we don't believe that discrimination is okay. And so we will be having a lot more information in weeks to come about this important issue. For now, there is a sign-on letter that was launched Monday evening on the front page of TexasImpact.org, and in the first about 24 hours, over 100 people had signed that letter. We would encourage you, if that issue is important to you, to go ahead and sign the sign-on letter at texasimpact.org, but don't stop there. Go ahead and send it out to all of your networks that might be interested and encourage them to sign as well. We'd also encourage you to go ahead and start calling your legislators on this issue to let them know that you feel that discrimination is not a faith value. You can find those uh, toll-free numbers on the Weekly Witness page at texasimpact.org slash weeklywitness. We encourage you to go ahead and share those numbers and start calling today. Also, go ahead and save the date. There will be, on August 1st, an opportunity for people of faith to come have their voices heard on that issue. So we'll be sending out more information on that, but go ahead and, and save the date for August 1st at the Texas Capitol. Um, if you have any questions about that, you can go ahead and email me at scott at texasimpact.org or keep an eye on the Texas Impact social media and website for more information. Or make sure you're signed up for the Texas Impact Rapid Response Team to receive up-to-the-minute updates. You can sign up for the Rapid Response Team at texasimpact.org slash take-action. Uh, so that's what's coming. We want to spend the bulk of t the time today talking about what happened during the course of the last legislative session. I've got two guys who basically lived in that building for the 140 days. Uh, I've got some questions that were submitted in advance, and we're just going to start having a conversation. Uh, so I'm going to start with Ahmad because it was his first time to work a, a Texas legislative session. And I'm going to go ahead. <laughs> Josh is laughing because it was a great one to start with Ahmad. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start with uh, your opening thoughts. As you look back on the legislative session, you've now had a couple of weeks, hopefully, to catch up on rest. Uh, what do you think? What are your opening thoughts and reflecting back? So, first opening thought, um, having a baby during the session, <laughs> probably not the easiest of times to have a baby, but we did have one in April. Congratulations. So, thank you. He's two months old now. Yeah, time that better next time. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll think about that. <laughs> Um, okay, so this was my first session, and going into it, uh, you know, B, Josh, and, and Beeman uh, told me this is going to be this is going to be an interesting session. Um, it's going to be uh, there's going to be a lot of difficult uh, parts of it. Uh, legislation is going to take a long time uh, to get passed. Like, just be be aware. So I was like, what should I do in order to prepare for the session? And they kept on saying. You just have to go through it. You have to. You have to. You have to go into the Capitol. You have to see it. You have to work it. Uh, there's really no describing what it's going to be like, and that turned out to be true. Uh, because every time I would have a plan for the day, I would go into the building thinking that I was going to meet, you know, a certain number of offices, or uh, you know, go to a certain hearing. That plan would change in the first hour that I got into the building. So no day was like. Uh, another and every plan that I had just sort of it was it was really up to 
whatever needed to get done that day. Um, so it was kind of hectic. It was uh, uh, really, really fascinating. Uh, at times it was really difficult, and Josh is going to talk a little bit about um, the beginning of the session, so I think I'll, I'll wrap around back to um, some of what he's going to talk about uh, after he says his thoughts. Okay, sure. Josh, this was not your first rodeo. No, uh, but the one thing you can do to prepare is uh, work out and, like, start around Labor Day, because <laughs> it is a marathon that will wear you out. Uh, I have a baby. Uh, we have a baby. My wife had a baby, actually. But, yeah, that happened at the end of October, so, yeah, November, December going into it, I was starting out tired, so it's, uh, it's interesting having small children uh, in the legislature. Um, switching gears. So back to the dumpster fire. Uh, here's why that's appropriate, I think. Uh, I'm going to work back. Because often you remember what happened most recently in your memory. So the very last day of a special session called Sunny Dyer, about another day in Latin, it's fun to say things in Latin, uh, there was a shoving match on the house floor. Uh, and some threats. Uh, both sides accusing the other side of issuing the threat. Anyway, here's what we know happened. We know that there was a big protest uh, over the sanctuary cities bill that had already passed and already been signed into law. Uh, they were disrupting the gallery, and it is fully within the rights of the chamber to clear the gallery. Uh, as the gallery was being cleared, one of the, uh, well, a state legislator named Matt Rinaldi uh, walked up to a couple of Latino legislators and said something to the effect, I can't remember exactly what it was, but uh, I've just called ICE on them. And I think it has since been uh, ferreted out by the media who investigated that that is true, ICE was called. Uh, but the immediate reaction of the Latino legislators was, this is exactly what we said, this is the profile that we suspected this bill would have, and, and they lost their cool. And part of, I mean, part of the losing of the cool, if you will, the anger, was, I mean, I'll be honest, I was surprised it took to the very last day before a fight occurred. There had been enough things happening deep on the inside that I, I was shocked that it hadn't happened sooner. Um, if you back up, we'll do back from Memorial Day, let's back up to April. Uh, that's when you had the Sanctuary Cities debate on the House floor. Uh, it was widely believed that the House was going to fix and make workable what was otherwise a very draconian and partisan bill that the Senate had lobbed over at the legislature. In fact, I had been telling a lot of people before session began, we did a lot of legislative trains and lobby trains before session began with different constituencies of ours, uh, that it was going to be a lot like a medieval war movie, where the Senate was going to be the catapults and the House was going to be the castle, and the Senate was going to be catapulting flaming balls of tar and diseased corpses over into the House, and the House was going to have to contend with that. And what I meant by that was it was all part of the kind of primary narrative that one chamber was going to try to create against the other chamber. And so what you have in Texas is kind of, a, as far as I know, a unique in state legislatures where you have one party controlled by the traditional wing of the Republican Party, which is the House, and the other chamber that is controlled by the Tea Party wing, uh, the insurgent wing of the Republican Party. And you really have this whole narrative playing out all session, and it came out in the Sanctuary Cities Bill. Um, so you had what was probably believed to be a House to fix it. Uh, and then it didn't turn out that way. So there's a, a group of 12 extreme legislators on the far right called the Freedom Caucus, and we're going to talk about them. They're a recurrent theme that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, the chair of his name is Representative Matt Schaefer, who proposed an amendment. And so what he proposed was to move the, the Sanctuary Cities Bill. The House had said, well, we're not going to inquire about immigration status until an arrest has occurred. So at that point, you're being booked for a crime that law enforcement has probable cause to believe that you committed. This is a more appropriate place to have this inquiry made. Um, but the amendment was to move it back to the point of lawful detention. And to kind of articulate in non-legal terms what lawful detention means, if you go through the metal detectors of the Capitol uh, and you set the machine off, uh, you're being lawfully detained while they wind you down. Because all it requires is the officer to be able to state an articulable fact uh, for having a reasonable suspicion that you committed a crime. And it may turn out that you did, but the machine wouldn't be is the articulable fact on, on that particular uh, situation. 
You have situations that involve uh, law enforcement responding to domestic disputes in the home. We're often going to detain everybody while they sort out what happened. So that includes witnesses. Uh, it includes witnesses, it includes victims, uh, and that's not um, just uh, limited to domestic disturbances, any crime for that matter. Often law, well, often law enforcement shows up at the scene and will detain a bunch of people, even in zip ties for that matter, until they can ascertain the situation because you're trying to get the situation under control. So they're in uh, so your traffic stops are lawful right. detention as well. Uh, I thought your license plate light was out. Lawfully detained. So this is a very low bar that's going to cause a high level of fear in the community. And it was really the bill. I mean, it was really uh, the difference between a true draconian bill and one that was not great, but, but would have less fear in the community. Um, and that amendment went on. The legislator said it in one uh, oh, yeah. testimony. This is the bill. Like, uh, so oh, yeah. the chair of state affairs uh, yeah. got up and said, folks, this is this amendment. There were quite a few amendments. And, but there were double digit numbers of amendments in this bill. Uh, and this, this one was the amendment that was the bill uh, for all intents and purposes. Uh, and what you saw was a complete meltdown for about three hours of debate while this amendment was being debated. Uh, there were attempts to kill the bill through parliamentary tricks and all that. Long story short, what you had was coming out of this debate a real kind of breakdown in the House. The final vote was something like 81 to 60 something. In the, it was really close vote, uh, and it was surprising to a lot of insiders. A lot of inside, insiders thought the center would hold. They thought that the Strauss faction of the Republican Party, uh, and especially some of the chairmen that were appointed by the speaker, who in theory should be loyal to the speaker, uh, would be able to defeat this amendment, and they were not. And that exposed the thing about the House that that really became the theme for the rest of the session. Uh, and you also saw even more fractiousness than that. What you saw was, uh, in that two and a half hours where it was melted down, was both of the parties went into caucus. And then within the parties, you saw the divisions of the Democratic Party come out, the divisions of the Republican Party come out, and there was a deal on the table and a lot of finger pointing by all kind of four factions, if you will, the Tea Party, the traditional Republicans, and then also kind of more hardliners in the Democratic Party and those that were trying to make a deal to make a thing that was going to be bad, less bad. Uh, and you see a lot of finger pointing about whose fault it was this very day. Everybody blames somebody else uh, for that amendment getting stuck on. But you can even back it up before that. Um, in March, there was House Bill 4, which wasn't an immigration bill at all, it was a foster care bill. And in theory, it should have been a very conservative bill because it's actually a kinship care bill where you're attempting to keep the kids with their families, which is a conservative family value. And in doing so, it actually would cost the state less money than putting a kid in foster care. And one of the biggest barriers to kinship care was that the state had given zero money to grandparents or uncles or, or a sibling who's old enough and, and of 18 years old or older. But there was no support for being able to take care of those children in the home. And so that was a big barrier for a lot of families to be able to, to otherwise take children that they wanted to have to keep in the family. So what the bill did is it provided a, a level of funding that was still a lesser amount than the cost of, of keeping the kid in foster care. So in theory, fiscally conservative, uh, family, you know, keeping families together. Uh, in theory, this is a very conservative bill, but one, uh, it turned into an immigration plan, uh, where they proposed, there was an amendment proposed by Representative Keogh that uh, no money would go to illegal immigrants on this thing. And so really, like, the issue of immigration suddenly became more important than like the cost to the state that would occur, the additional cost by having children of people who were potentially undocumented put in foster care. Um, so it was a really weird cognitive moment in the Republican Party uh, about whether uh, the racial politics of immigration or the fiscal conservative winning was going to prevail. And they eventually convinced this, this legislator to pull his amendment down. But, but at that point, it was very clear. This was one of the first big bills that the House faced in March. Uh, when things moved out of committee to the floor. This was a major bill, it was House Bill 4, uh, and it turned into this great big fight that kind of showed insiders how the rest of the session was going to operate. But you can see it happening even before that, in January. So uh, there was a, in January, before any committee should be meeting, before committees were even named, uh, there was a big fake committee. Just for fake news, there was a literal fake committee. 
uh, where one of the new freshmen named Kyle Biederman uh, and uh, members of the Freedom Caucus, I don't know if they had actually formed yet to be a Freedom Caucus, but they were all of the eight or nine or so members who sat on the dais with them, uh, held this event that was dubbed originally a Homeland Security Hearing at which expert testimony would be taken on the issue of uh, terrorism. And of course, if you Googled the expert witnesses, they were not experts, they were the small cadre of people who go around the country stirring up fear about the Muslim community. Uh, and this event was held after the uh, mosques and right. uh, student groups, Muslim student groups across the state received uh, a letter, which was actually a survey um, from the representative uh, asking personal beliefs about their religion. Um, so, you know, we had mosques and, calling yeah, us and, up. And it was alluded to to be connected to Texas Muslim Catholic. I mean, I can't, I can't remember the exact word, but you could read it and misinterpret it to me. I think it said, in, in, yeah, there was some exact yeah, wording that made it, 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 it seem like it was an official yeah. Muslim Capital Day survey that you should fill out before you come to the Capitol. So given our constituency, we had been involved in this thing because we had written a, a letter to all the mosques and, and student associations that we had access to to say, don't respond to this thing. This is wildly inappropriate for legislators to be asking. And then he doubled down on it by having this event that he called a Homeland Security Hearing. Which there's a few small problems with that. One, there's an actual Homeland Security Committee in the House. That's problem one. <laughs> and it, he and is not the chairman of it. And problem number two is under law, he has no authority to put anybody under oath. Only chairman or actual chairman of actual committees have the authority to do that. And he was making misrepresentations that he was going to be doing that by saying expert testimony. Yeah. Uh, and the expert testimony, expert testimony, a lot of them were known instigators, right? People who had access to grind. And, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, it'd be like if you asked, the Christian, asked Christopher Hitchens or Richard Dawkins to opine about the Christian community. Right? Yeah. People uh, uh, who clearly were either, uh, yeah, who had an extra grind against the faith. And like I said, you Google the so called experts and they were a small cadre of Islamophobes that are well known to those who watch that kind of thing. Uh, and, and so, anyway, the event did happen anyway. Uh, and it happened in one of the committee hearing rooms. So when the media is there with cameras taking pictures, uh, the representative is sitting in the chairman's seat with the people, the so-called experts, in, um, uh, sitting at the table where you would normally take testimony, and eight or nine members of the Freedom Caucus, the most extreme wing, sitting up there with him with their official house nameplates, the state seal of Texas behind them, and he's recognizing people to ask questions of the witnesses if it was uh, an actual committee. Uh, it was a complete fake committee. Uh, and so that happened in January. I mean, that was one of the first events of the 85th legislature. But I gotta take it back one more spot. I gotta take it back to March 2016. This is the primary. I was still in school at that point. Yeah, this is the primary. Uh, if you wanna know why any of this happened, if you wanna know why any of the big overview session of why this happened, you have to go back to March 2016. 95% of the state legislature is elected in the primary. There's 181 House, or 181 legislative seats, 150 in the House, 31 in the Senate. Of the 150 in the House, seven are in play come November in a general election. Maybe one is in play in the Senate come November. Otherwise, they're all drawn in such a way as to be safe districts for whatever party to protect the incumbent. And so this, the, this is both parties. Uh, this, the race that they're most worried about, 95% of them, uh, is the March primary, not the November general election. Uh, because they largely can predict, I mean, past behavior is, is indicative of future behavior. Uh, and so it's really, with computer technology, pretty easy to draw these digital lines in a way that are very predictable. And part of that is there's such a low turnout. Uh, not just in the November general election, there's the exponentially lower turnout in the primary. I mean, maybe 3% of the state uh, elected affirmatively went in in the primary runoff and said, I want Ted Cruz to be U.S. Senator in 2012. Uh, fewer than 3% went in in 2014 and said, I want Dan Patrick Ruby to together. Uh, there is that low turnout in these primaries where 3% of the voting age population uh, can determine the outcome. And so that is what they are worried about. They are worried about these extremely low turnout primaries. They're not worried about the November general election by and large because the, the, the seats just aren't that competitive. People who vote tend to vote. Uh, 
and people who don't vote tend to never vote. And they are able to kind of largely predict, uh, um, based on past performance, those districts. And so really, that is what is creating the energy and what is driving the policy conversation uh, in that building. So I'm 99% sure that we're going to hear a lot more about that in the months to come, post-special session as, as we lead towards election season again. And you just reminded me how bad it was <laughs> during the legislative session. I feel like I, I'd slept a little since then, and, and it's all coming back to me now. Uh, talk for a few minutes, both of you, if you will, about some accomplishments you feel like the Texas Impact Community, the Weekly Witness Community, accomplished during the course of the legislative session. Yeah, I mean, even in, even, so even in the worst session, there are always small, small things that get accomplished. Uh, and sometimes accomplishments are also frustrating, but we'll start with the ones that are kind of, let's, let's be positive. Um, there was more money for mental health. By and large, there was a lot of progress made on, on mental health that built on the progress made in the 84th. And you can largely credit uh, Speaker Strauss to that. It's a thing that he has prioritized, and the House as a whole has prioritized uh, for a couple of sessions in a row. We have kind of uh, worked on the nexus of mental health and criminal justice, and so you saw, uh, because people get that we're using our prison system as a mental health uh, hospital, which is ridiculous and not cost effective and not, not effective for the people in there, uh, for anybody. Uh, so there were a couple, a couple of small but important bills that made it through on mental health. Um, Mike, you want to talk about the blacklist bill a little bit now that it's signed? And yeah. Uh, and I'm talking about some of their accomplishments too. But, uh, so, we there. Talk about that at yeah, SB 253 was a 30 page state investments bill. Um, it would. Uh, it, the bill amended a, a section of the code that decided that would uh, state for Texas which companies and which countries they could do business with. And hidden on page, I don't know, what page was it? Oh, buried about two thirds of the way in. Page, you know, two thirds of the way into this thirty-page bill was this small little paragraph. Well, it was a, it was a section of the, uh, of the bill that said that the state uh, could not invest in companies that had ties with foreign terrorist organizations. And in that section, uh, it said as a definition for a foreign ter terrorist organization, uh, it was determined by the state's controller's office. And the state controller's office could uh, take input on their designation from nonprofits, could take input from the state department, the federal state department, um, and you know, research institutions. Yeah, so in federal law, I mean, just to kind of back up, in federal law, it's the state, it's the US State Department that, that, that determines whether somebody is a foreign terrorist organization or not. That's yeah. a federal thing. I mean, that's the whole apparatus of the, of the federal government's intelligence networks and, and such. The That's state, their job. The comptroller's office is the state of the state's account. They are not an intelligence agency. Right. And so, first of all, they don't necessarily have the competence to make a determination. And then they were going to gather evidence from nonprofits. So, Texas Impact would be somehow competent to put forth evidence that some other organization was a foreign terrorist organization. Any or, there was there was literally no standard no. for what could be a foreign terrorist organization. Any nonprofit could put their input in. And they were going to publish it on the website of the comptroller's office. It was going to be publicly made available. There was no appeals process, no ability to challenge whether or not you were a foreign terrorist organization. There was no ability to get your name taken off the list. I and mean, there was no due process protection on it whatsoever. If some nonprofit somewhere yeah. wanted to advocate for your organization to be put on this publicly listed state website, that, that could have happened. Yeah, it, was, it was a blacklist. And it could it have was, worked, and to be fair, it wouldn't. I mean, we were obviously concerned about how Islamophobes might use it against the Muslims in the, in the state of Texas. But it could have worked in the opposite. I mean, indivisible, or I don't know, somebody on the left could have I mean, easily made accusations about Russia yeah. and, and politicized it that way as well. And so, anyway. I mean, yeah, and our, our business kind was. Of out the it, we didn't really necessarily have a position on. Who or what the state invested in? We really just wanted to make sure that potential abuses and infringements on, on rights were limited through that language. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, so anyway, to give the benefit of the doubt to the author, I mean, once yeah. it kind of got raised, oh yeah, it, the Senate quickly got that provision out of there and the bill passed, you know, easy because mm -hmm. I mean, no one else had any opposition whatsoever. Or should they? 
Uh, but I mean, but it was a it was a it was a small fix, yeah. but a really really important one, um, and it got fixed very quickly. It got fixed very quietly, uh, which is great. Yeah, we didn't want to talk about it until the signing period was over. Yeah, <laughs> and now it's been signed until law. Just paranoia. Um, being a good lobbyist, being paranoid, making sure that that got fixed. Uh, but that's a small fix. Uh, there was a completely same thing changing subjects. There was a small uh, a bill having to do with a, like a graphic bill. Let me back up and say. So one of the ways that we pay lending was kind of a failure. But often we try to address that issue from the supply side. Uh, in other words, trying to fix the product itself. Uh, but there was a small bill that was helping to work on it from, to reduce the need for payment. Uh, by encouraging people to save their own money in open savings accounts. Uh, I think 25% of the state is underbanked. Uh, I think it's even lower. It's, uh, I can't remember the number, but a good number of people in the state just don't use a bank account whatsoever. Uh, and so I'm trying to incentivize people to use banks and to save their own money, because that's the best defense to, to, to not have to use a bank loan is to be able to save their own money. Um, this, we had a bill, uh, Representative Eric Johnson put forth a bill, uh, that we, we supported and supported for a couple of sessions that would allow uh, banks and credit unions to be able to experiment with, uh, and other states have done this as well, to, to, to quite successfully, to then, so whenever you make a monthly deposit, your name and you are entered into a raffle uh, where they do a prize drawing at the end of the month, like a lottery, only it's not like a lottery because you get to keep your own money. Uh, you're not putting anything at risk. So you'd make a monthly deposit, and there's going to be a raffle and be a prize giveaway at the end of the month. And so it's encouraging you to make a monthly deposit and save your own money. Uh, it was vetoed uh, last session, even though it passed with very little opposition last session. Uh, it was vetoed because uh, of a legal argument by the governor uh, that it constituted gambling. Texas does have a pretty broad definition of gambling. We didn't think it was. We we're opposed to gambling as an organization and we support this bill. Nevertheless, this time around, we, we did a constitutional amendment, an HJR, to amend the Constitution, so you'll be able to vote on that in November. Uh, we obviously support it. Uh, there was a, uh, another accomplishment that I think is really important. We called it the Penn State Amendment. So switching subjects again to, to foster care, uh, late, late hour, and this is the value of having somebody watching a lot of times, maybe it's about 9, 10 p.m. or but it was a late night amendment in the Senate. And you gotta watch the late night amendments in the Senate. Uh, and this was one, where they stuck an amendment on a bill that was going to grant immunity from civil liability to providers that provide foster care. And the way it was written, we called it the Penn State Amendment. And if you remember the Penn State scandal, uh, what the amendment allowed was, so the Penn State, let me give you the facts of the Penn State scandal for those who may not have followed the sports. It was a guy named Jerry Sandusky, and he sexually abused children uh, for many years. And the Penn State program very much covered it up uh, actively. And so the way this amendment was written without giving you the difference between gross negligence and ordinary negligence, uh, the way this amendment was written is Jerry Sandusky would have been civilly liable for, for his actions. Penn State would not have been. And so what this was going to do was inoculate the providers from the actions of their employees. And we thought that was wildly important to do uh, because a lot of malfeasance can be had that doesn't constitute gross negligence. And so we called it the Penn State Amendment. We worked with uh, other stakeholders in trying to strip this amendment off. It took several days of going around educating people on it just to get it pulled off. Uh, but we got it pulled off, and that's the thing. Uh, we had some compromise language just to affirm that there's already in civil practice number is code of community to any charitable organization, any nonprofit chapter, if you have civil practice number is code. So we had a compromise where we just clarified that you know any foster care provider was under chapter 84. We thought that was already true, but if it makes me feel better to put it in law, great. Terrific. So we got a compromise on that uh, and got the Penn State amendment pulled out. So I was very happy about that. So these are some things that are not in the, uh, the online version. Yeah. Written version of, of our wrap up that we've been kind of going into. I know one of the things I'm most proud of this last legislative session was the work that you all, 
the Weekly Witness community did both uh, here and online. Uh, our rapid response folks made over 5,000 telephone calls on issues that uh, Texas Impact and people of faith found to be important. I know there were a couple of bills that they worked on specifically uh, that, that were accomplishments. Do you want to talk for a second about a couple of those? Yeah, so we talked a lot uh, when we would do our kind of weekly hot list. Uh, there were three bills we talked a lot about. Um, they all had to do with continuous eligibility, uh, which is a policy term for whenever somebody is on medic a child is on Medicaid or CHIP, how they go about getting renewed. So one of the things the state does that's to, to cut the rolls is they make parents renew their kids every six months in order to trip them up as opposed to every year annually. Uh, and another shenanigan they'll do is that um, all the kids, so the parents will have multiple children, but all the children won't be renewed at the same time. It'll be, so instead of every six months, it can be every two months a parent is having to renew one of their child's, uh, one of their child's uh, chip uh, for healthcare. A couple of those bills didn't pass, uh, but so we worked a lot on community eligibility. The one that did pass was House Bill 337, which unfortunately didn't help children, uh, but it did help uh, with people that go to prison. This is a mental health bill. So when people would go into the county jail, uh, or prison for that matter, the um, state penitentiary, um, they would lose the, they would cancel or, or terminate the, the Medicaid, uh, their Medicaid revenue. And the problem is, is they, they would receive mental health treatment while in prison. But then when they were released from prison, there was a great big onerous blockade to getting that Medicaid renewed. And so in the meantime, upon being released from prison and having Medicaid renewed, you would often have weeks go by where you're not having mental health treatment. And you couldn't get the meds even if you wanted. It's not that they didn't want to take their medications, they couldn't take the medication because they, they didn't have access to it. Yep. Uh, and so one of the bills that did pass was House Bill 337, which we all made a lot of calls on, uh, that made it to where it was just suspended and not terminated so that it could be instantly put back in place upon somebody's release from prison or jail. Uh, sounds common sense, it was a huge lift. Uh, the reason I went into those other bills is that the, all these bills that I'm talking about past the house, the one for, for children being renewed, uh, the one for uh, prisoners uh, being renewed past the house pretty easily. Uh, they hit a roadblock in the Senate. Uh, they got stuck in Senate Health and Human Services, and whether that was the chairman or the lieutenant governor, it's kind of murky as to who exactly responsible for that, staying in the committee. But right at the very end of session, the last waning days, a lot of calls got made. Y'all called, the counties called, mental health community, uh, advocates called, doctors called, law enforcement called. I mean, it took a lot to get this bill moved out of committee and passed in the Senate. Uh, but the one having to do with the prisons and the, uh, did. Uh, and that's gonna be a, a pretty big savings to, to local communities. Yeah. Uh, because I mean, they were paying for that recidivism. People were going back into prison because they would have a mental health crisis, and they had a mental health crisis because they couldn't continue the treatment that they had gotten when they were in prison, and which is just ridiculous. So that was one good thing that y'all certainly helped uh, dislodge. Um, there are others that are escaping my memory. At this yeah, point. the detention center license. Oh yeah, so that was a good thing that didn't pass. Yeah. Um, baby jails. Best name. Um, this was the one where unaccompanied minors, or they're in their, sometimes they work with their mom, uh, would come over. Uh, and these are people fleeing South America, Central America. Um, they are fleeing violence. They really are asylees. And so in that sense, it's not an illegal immigration issue. They are asylees that have legal protections under the law. Uh, they, uh, they appear on the border, they turn themselves in immediately. Border Patrol will whisk them away to now what are called detention centers. And what they are is they're prisons that have been converted to child care facilities. So there's been federal uh, litigation over this issue. Uh, how long can you hold a family in detention? Uh, and because they're not licensed as child care facilities, which the judge reasoned, federal judge reasoned, that they need to be released as soon as possible. Of course, that means that the private prison companies that run these detention centers aren't making as much money as they like to make, so they wrote a bill and uh, put it in both chambers, 
and it passed the Senate. Uh, went all the way through the Senate and the House. It was moving uh, to allow them to be licensed as child care centers. They're prisons. So that's why we call them baby jails. But really they wanted to be called child care centers so they could hold people in detention longer to get more money from their federal contracts. Uh, luckily from many calls from people like you, that bill did not get out of the House State Affairs. And that is where it great, uh, grace, uh, gracefully and we're grateful that it died in House State Affairs. We did get, get two questions online. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, I'll also go ahead and remind everybody that we are still taking questions in the comment section of Facebook Live and the chat section of the webinar, which is on the bottom of the screen, the bubble looking button. Uh, maybe it's because it's the day after a holiday. Those questions are coming in slower today than they were last week, but the two that we received online in advance. Uh, could you give us more information about the content of the religious freedom amendments that were attached to the four sunset bills? Yeah, so one of the things that the, uh, we talked about the Freedom Caucus a little bit, the most extreme 12 members of the Texas House. Uh, one of, once that, so going back to the Schaefer Amendment on Sanctuary Cities Bill, once it was exposed that a lot of House members were afraid to take votes in public, that just became the thing all session long. So uh, they proposed these religious freedom amendments to uh, sunset bills. Let me back up and explain what sunset bills are. About every 12 years or so, every state agency goes through sunset review. And so what we're looking, uh, what the state is looking at is kind of, okay, now that it's been over a decade, how is your agency operating? Uh, is it operating as efficiently as it could be? Does it need to exist? Is what it was doing what it needs to be doing? What should it be doing in the future? Big, broad bills on very broad subject matter. So the state bar, uh, the board of law examiners, which is similar, uh, board of Nursing and the Board of Pharmacy were all four sunset bills looking at these whole boards. And so what were proposed were these four amendments, and every one of them was written a little bit different, and every one of them conflicted with the existing Texas Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Let me back up to 1999 when we passed the Texas Religious Freedom Restoration Act. It has been a model for how a state should do a Religious Freedom Restoration Act. They've been in the news a lot lately uh, because the religious right is trying to rewrite them. Uh, they're trying to rewrite them because they didn't get what they wanted back in 1999 when they had broad consensus from the entire faith community. In 1999, there was a broad stakeholder process, a big coalition of 50 different faith groups who all agreed. Uh, it struck a proper balance between individual rights and the individual rights of third parties where you can't impose your religion on somebody else. Uh, and a lot of these amendments, fast forwarding to, to 2017, uh, would disrupt it. So the law on the Board of Pharmacy, for instance. Uh, a thing has often arisen where pharmacists don't want to give certain forms of birth control to, uh, uh, to people with a valid prescription uh, because they have religious objections to giving birth control to somebody. It's a lot like the wedding cake issue, if you're familiar with that, where I'm a religious person who doesn't want to give you a thing you were legally and lawfully entitled to because, you know, my religion. Well, wait a minute, now your religion is imposing on somebody else's religion, and that is an inappropriate balance to be struck. So there were these four bills that had these, these amendments attached to it that were all a little bit different, and they all conflicted with existing law, and it was going to cause a big problem. A uh, big uh, thank you to Senator Watson. When these bills got in the Senate, he was authoring one of the uh, state uh, the uh, uh, state bar, which of course regulates every attorney in the state. So that was helpful to have a big, powerful constituency of attorneys who were going to be affected by this thing uh, for cover for people. And so what they were able to work out was the compromise. Uh, and what the final version that came out of conference committee looked like was good. Essentially, it does not conflict with the Texas uh, Religious Freedom Restoration Act. It strikes, in fact, it basically references the Religious Freedom Restoration Act and says uh, that what we're talking about is you know, that these four agencies uh, have to comply with the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, essentially. It references back to the existing code. It does not disrupt current law. Uh, it basically just says current law applies to you, which we would have argued it already did. Uh, so in a lot of ways, these four amendments uh, now completely compatible with the existing Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which nobody really has uh, 
major issue with. So that was a, a, actually a really big win um, on, on the industry and stuff. The other question that came in online in advance relates to the wrap-up in the family security section asking about House Bill 4102 by Representative Biave, uh, asking what it means to crowdfund money. You're younger than I am, you want this one? Sure. So, uh, anytime that you have, the, let's just back up to this, what, what the rate kit is, it's an evidence collection kit, and the state has a backlog of over, like a couple thousand, I think 3,000 is the estimate, um, and that last was taken in 2015, I think, something like that. I mean, there's, there hasn't been a, a, an accurate number of, the, of that backlog in a really long time. Uh, and the state needs money in order to analyze these, these kits. Um, what this bill does is that it allows uh, people when they apply for the driver's license uh, for an original one or to renew one to donate uh, at least a dollar to a, a fund that would let this allow the state to analyze these this backlog of, of red kits. So um, that's what the crowdfunding aspect of it is. It's anybody going in Get, it's, a, it's a donation, basically, uh, which means that there isn't enough state funds uh, to analyze these, these rape kits. So the people are coming to uh, crowdfund, uh, essentially, this, this system. And you see crowdfunding online for other things, like Kickstarter and GoFundMe, and these kinds of things are also called crowdfunding. Um, this is uh, setting up a donation whenever you apply for your driver's license. The question you should ask yourself is, why are we having the crowdfund to test rape kits in the first place. That's astounding to me that the state uh, can't just cough up the money to do the DNA testing and other evidence testing that they do in order to try to enforce the law against people who have been sexually assaulted. This is enforcement of the law. This is also exoneration for people who are falsely accused. Um, these yeah. are, these are, there's a lot of, a lot of enforcement. <laughs> so that's a good segue to frustrations. Can we talk about that? Absolutely. I was going to ask before that, is, is, okay. is this a new concept? Or have we heard of crowdfunding state services anywhere else? Or is this a new movement? That... I don't know. I'm not even sure if this is a state service. Is this is. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I haven't studied uh, crowdfunding uh, essential government services. I'm not an expert on that. So, yeah, I was. We did talk about accomplishments earlier, frustrations from the legislative session that we haven't gotten to yet. Yeah, I'll start off with one. Uh, the. The one that keeps sticking in my mind is uh, is a one is a bill that I thought was, and I think a lot of people thought, uh, was very straightforward. It would have uh, required schools to test their water systems for lead. Um, there were two bills. Um, uh, one of them required remediation of the uh, lead in the water system if lead was found. In other words, the school district would have to. Fix they would it. have to fix it. By Another bill uh, didn't require it, but it did require schools to test for lead contaminants. And then inform parents. And then that, that was a key Which, in theory, the democratic process at the local level. Once, your, so once parents are informed of lead contamination, I doubt that there's going to be a little inaction uh, on that. They would be comfortable with their kids <laughs> drinking lead out of the water fountains. Uh, you know, there was a lot of support for this bill. And I really thought that it was going to at least get out of the calendars committee. Um, but it got caught up in there and uh, got stuck in that one. Uh, I, was, I really wanted that one to go through. I mean, there was a lot of bills that I wanted yeah, to go Senate, through, the but Senate that one version, in particular. Yeah, the Senate companion also got stuck on what is the intent calendar, which is uh, functionally the Senate. Uh, so it didn't, it, didn't get a, it didn't get a vote, basically, on the floor. Yeah. <clears throat> My biggest one is probably public, ed public education. Uh, and that's honestly the state's biggest one, but if you're measuring it with regards to money. Uh, the biggest thing the state does, financially, is public education. The biggest thing your state tax dollars go to, because there's a lot of federal funding that comes from health care, but it's almost entirely state tax dollars to go to public education. Um, this one just ground down in a tale of two chambers. I mean, you have just two competing visions, uh, completely competing visions. You have a house uh, where a lot of rural Republicans support public education, uh, and then you have a Senate that is led by a lieutenant governor who's insistent on privatizing public education uh, through vouchers. And so House Bill 21 was a very good bill uh, 
Um, that was the House version by Representative Chairman Hubert. Uh, that would have meant almost $2 billion, so $1.9 billion with a B, uh, additional dollars to public education, and every school district would have seen more money of some kind. It also updated the funding formulas that go into how we fund public education. That's very important for some rural districts. Because there are some rural districts who, when oil and gas prices were high, were doing very well. And now that oil and gas prices have dropped, uh, they're looking at closing, uh, potentially, some rural school districts uh, because they couldn't get this fix done. Uh, when House Bill 21 cleared the House, got over the Senate, uh, the Senate stripped the money out of it almost entirely. They uh, cut 75% of the new money and left $500 million in there, uh, just to say that there was an increase, but really they cut three quarters of the increase, where, and at that amount of money, not every district would have seen more money, uh, and then they stuck the voucher provision in there, uh, which of course would have diverted money from public education to private education, uh, which just continues to, to choke off the public schools uh, of money that they need as they continue to underfund public education. Uh, that was a non-starter in the House, and that's where the bill died. Um, so there was a, a floor debate on, on the amendments in the House on the voucher programs for, it was very specific, so it wasn't vouchers for everybody, it was vouchers for special needs. Right. Um, and the uh, proponents of that amendment, they were, you know, citing the needs of special needs kids to have these services. And the person at the other end of the podium, uh, at the, uh, on the other end of the floor, Chairman Huberty, he himself has a special needs child. Yeah. And right. so it was, it was a really just uh, a, a difficult uh, yeah. debate and, to have. Yeah, and here's the debate. They keep saying, well, it's not one size fits all, and private schools may be better for certain kids. Well, public schools could do that if you gave them the money. They could probably do it more efficiently if you gave them the money. Uh, but we've been choking public education in the state for, for over a decade, uh, session after session. Because then I want to make a point about the budget here, because this budget doesn't keep up with uh, population and inflation growth in the school system. Uh, so essentially, it is a reduction. It's not a numerical cut to the amount of money. But if you keep the money the same year after year, inflation happens. And Texas is a growing state, so more children happen, and they're being continually asked, the public school system is being continually asked to do more with less. And they tend to fly, pass with flying colors. Uh, but how long can you keep that up, being asked to do more with less? I mean, there's been this narrative of new testing after new testing after new testing, and then it was TOS, and then it was TALCS, and then it was STAR, and then it was uh, into course exams. And every time the public schools Passed it, they need, oh, well, we need to create a new test because we want to push this narrative of failing public schools. Well, no, they're not. In fact, even the Supreme Court opinion talks about how uh, minority uh, Hispanic and African Americans, uh, are, are their reading levels are much higher compared to the rest of the nation, even though we give so much less money to a public school system to do it with. So uh, that's just a, a major frustration. One that will continue to be discussed in months to come, I'm sure. Yes, and now, I should note that more money for public education is not part of the, well, there's not actually an official proclamation yet on the special session, but it is not one of the 20 things we talk about. All right. Paul asks a question online that I'm not sure, sitting around the table, we have uh, expertise to answer today, but he says that his local county judge wrote an editorial in the local paper saying that SB1 mandates that local property tax collections be increased by 7.04% in 2017 and almost 7% in 2018. This seems to ignore actual property valuations. Is this correct? I haven't heard that, but um, I would need to know a few more facts before I'd be able to say he was wrong. Uh, I just don't know. That is not a thing I've heard of. Um, there's a lot of talk about property taxes uh, that we had, that was had, that will be had, regular and special. Uh, I haven't heard that come up a lot. Hey Paul, why don't you go ahead and send us that uh, that editorial uh, email to me and we'll take a look. Uh, process yeah. question that came up from Kathleen. Is there any recourse for overturning vetoes? <laughs> in theory, uh, yes. In reality, no. Um, and it has to do, and I'm 
It has to do with how our Constitution is written, and there's an amount of time that the legislature can do it, but the problem is that they're not in session to do it, and that's often why a governor will wait uh, until after Sunday die to begin vetoing things, uh, so that the legislature can't come back and overrun the veto. So in theory, in theory, yes, there's a procedure for doing so. In reality, it's not well written, and it's able to be available. Gentlemen, I think that's all we have online. Do you have any closing thoughts before I close this out tonight? How did you like the session, Josh? <laughs> hey, it was the worst one I've been through. Uh, and, and, I, and I'm not the best person. I've, I've been this for about 12 years. Uh, I've talked to other, it's not that long, you know, just at the time. I was going to say, it's relative. Every time I say, I'm, uh, you know, uh, this is my first session, Josh, whenever he talks about his experience, he's like, yeah, I just started. And it's, it's your fifth session, is that? Oh, uh, 05 was my first, so we can... Yeah, I got a long time before, before I uh, six. started talking about that. So, Bob, you can honestly say this was your best session, I guess. Uh, <laughs> that is factually correct. I think it would be also factually correct to say that it was my worst session. You know, well, being a lobbyist, I mean, it is a, a very small world of people in the Pink Dome. Uh, and there are people who have been around 30, 40, 50 years, and if you talk to them, they have called it kind of impressive. They, they've all said, almost in the almost to every single one I've talked to, has said this is unprecedented. This is an environment that they're not even sure how to work in, and that they're not entirely, uh, they're not happy with it, and they're not, they're not successful either. It's a very rough environment, even for, for very seasoned veterans. And the two things that you mentioned, the, um, the Schaefer Amendment on SB4, which was the lawful detainment amendment, and then also the HB4 amendment um, for undocumented families um, happening so early in March. Those two things, I think, were jarring for, for people. I think people were expecting, yeah, I was, we're not expecting those things no, to go. No, I, I was sitting in the House gallery for HB4, the very first bill, big major bill, where the immigration fight popped up on foster care. And the, the, the rhetoric, uh, the words that legislators used with each other in the debate. Um, I mean, I was sitting next to a, a, a lobbyist who's one of those seasoned veterans I was talking about, been around 30, 40 years. And he goes, this is the kind of thing you hear in late May that legislators say to one another because you can't walk those things back. Yeah. This is March. This is astounding. Yeah. The, uh, the, I think the other... The other takeaway for me, and again, I can look at this with fresh eyes, um, but uh, the, I think transparency on the floor debates and by legislators about the influence of uh, elections and primaries. You know, I think on SB4 in particular, we, we, we have that video, um, uh, but it, it, you know, that being a factor in the policy discussion was so apparent when, uh, I don't think, I think in past sessions, Josh Yeah, was it, it was often a thing, uh, insiders knew it, but it wasn't a thing you'd hear confess yeah. uh, on the floor. You would always have some, at least, attempt at debate from policy uh, But you had legislators just admitting uh, to uh, the influence of primaries. Because sometimes it's hard to understand why the session was hard, and some of those are like tangible things that indicate, oh, this is why it was hard. Because especially for me, I didn't, I, I went in here not knowing what to expect. Um, so I, I, think I learned a lot uh, this session. I'm really, really glad that I was able to uh, experience this and yeah, learn I mean, from it. The link between elections and policy making is sometimes hard for people. And yeah. people drew it for them in public in ways that were fascinating. Uh, and that's the thing about, I mean, is government broken? No, nah, it's doing exactly what those that vote tell it to. It's working just fine in democracy. Uh, it's that this is what the, I mean, if the voters need to look in the mirror. If you're not a voter, you need to look yourself in the mirror. I mean, that's really the deal, right? I mean, it's very low participation. Uh, especially knowing when the right race is where your vote is most effective. Yeah. There's a very low. Because I think election is in November. Right. People think but November. In Texas, if I'm a Texan, when I think election, I think March. That's right. Well, so, so to close us out today, I think we did have opportunities this legislative session as people of faith to look ourselves in the mirror and look at the narrative that was being drawn 
by the media and throughout the state about what people of faith in Texas are saying. And it's important that we, as members of Texas Impact and as the different denominational and, and adjudicatory groups that we represent, to have our voice be heard. And I've been inspired by the way that you have participated in the process throughout this session. Uh, the hundreds of people who participated in the rapid response team, the thousands of telephone calls that went in, and the challenge that I would have for us over the course of the next couple of weeks. And I'll use the, the sign-on letter related to the anti-discrimination piece of legislation they're working on. In the first 24 hours, we had 100 people uh, add their name to an online letter. My challenge for us is to not think about how we act on our own, but what if those 100 people who signed on each got another 100 people from their congregations or 100 people from their local networks to also sign on? We've talked throughout Weekly Witness over the course of the last few months about this is, this is a long game. Uh, our journey towards the kingdom of God and, and um, the United Methodist, so in Wesleyan language, our journey toward perfection might sometimes seem, seem long. Uh, but let's start that journey and let's see how many more people we can get involved. Uh, we will be back for Weekly Witness on Monday, July 17th, here at the Murchison Chapel at First United Methodist Church. And we'll be here every Monday during the special session. We would encourage you to be here in person as often as possible. We'd especially encourage you to be here on August 1st for that, uh, for that day where we'll be having conversations about discriminatory legislation. But we'll also be online uh, via Facebook Live and webinar. Keep an eye on Texas Impact social media to figure out how you can get involved, and we will talk to you soon. Uh, thanks for tuning in today. Uh, email us or email me at scott at texasimpact.org if you have questions. We'll look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks for all you do.